a year. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and we pay our respects to elders both past and present. And today we're lucky to have uh, Andrew McKenzie and Karen Erlemans, I hope I got that right Karen, from the University of Canberra and they are going to uh, present a, a presentation called Passenger in the Studio, the Intentional Use of Learning Technologies to Improve Learning Outcomes in the Studio. And this is uh, particularly relevant to a lot of the people in the room we have today who have come from our School of Art and Architecture, uh, which is, sorry, and Designs, Art, Architecture and Design. There's a D in there, isn't there? I'm sorry about that. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Andrew and Karen and thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Andrew. I'm Karen, obviously. <laughs> That's a good start. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, we're not, not uh, in a good old camper. We're not so, so into a webinar, so forgive us if we're a bit stodgy on it. Um, Karen? Me? Yep. So can you good? just uh, test my audio for me, please? Uh, I can hear you fine. Uh, audio oh, good. Too many things to do. Can you hear our audio okay? Karen, is my audio coming through for you? Yes, yes it is. Yep, yep, okay, your microphone's green up the top? Yes. Yep. Yep, yep, okay. 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 So, sorry guys. No, that's all right. Can you just have another go? Can you just talk to us? Hello, how are you? Good morning everybody, welcome, very early. Can you just go select the microphone? Okay, okay, so I've got you coming through here, so that's good. You can still hear my audio? Right, yeah. We can still hear you, yep. Yeah. Yep, excellent, okay, it won't be long. We're getting a lot of feedback, <laughs> static here. <laughs> oh. No, we can't hear that. Yeah. Can you go back to the general chat? What are you doing? I don't know how to do it. Hi, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Can, you can hear us okay? We can't hear a thing from over there now. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay. So, we can wrap up. Okay. So, uh, yeah, welcome. So, we, we've been running a project at the university here for two years now. Um, uh, it came out of a, um, uh, a, a need for a curriculum review um, where we actually did focus quite a bit on our assessment processes. And part of that was also um, looking at the way in which students in first year engaged with uh, feedback and how they translated that feedback into um, learning outcomes. Um, Yeah, and so anyway, so that's what we did, and so um, so part of that, of course, was then to actually look at this in the context of how um, how other programs around Australia um, uh, dealt with studio environment. Uh, in 2013, I edited a special issue of a journal um, called Fusion Fusion Journal, and we wrote a, a um, it was called the Studio the actual. Uh, Journal itself. So it's a good starting point to look at the idea of how we would use technology to improve learning outcomes in the studio. Um, Karen, as, as a curriculum designer, um, her role in the, in the project was to actually um, give us the, uh, the, the pedagogical um, uh, arguments, I guess, in terms of the value of feedback and how feedback could be used. And my role um, 
what was my role? I think my role was just to keep it going. Yeah. yeah. Subject so, matter expert. Subject matter <laughs> expert, possibly. Um, but also, as I was at the time, I was head of discipline, so I had yeah. some some way of being able to actually run this whole thing. Yeah. So I'm going to pass on to that. That's the wrong way. Um, okay. So I, we we're basing this presentation on our um, original presentation that we were going to do at Isotl, but. So the first part of our presentation is actually from that original presentation, but because you know this was for 2015 and we've actually moved on and we've done a lot more work on it, um, we're going to go on and, and present some of our later findings as well. Um, in 2013, the Grattan Institute actually introduced uh, released a very large report which looked at online learning and, and what it looked like in the classroom uh, at the university level, um, and you know found that. Probably about 18% of our students actually are now studying off campus and that number is increasing annually. So this is 2014. We know that the numbers are going up regularly. So uh, of which 9% are, are actually in a mixed modality, which is, you know, they're doing some blended, some face-to-face. -face. Uh, and we're certainly finding that here where students are choosing to come in at some point and not at other times. And so one of the things that we really wanted to look at was what was the implications of that for architecture, which of course is predominantly face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, or certainly here at UC is predominantly face-to-face. -face. We found that over that time, um, over the last three years or so, uh, that there's been a lot of pressure on the academics, both in terms of the change in students' expectations and also in terms of the digital creep within the, um, the classroom. Um, and so we really wanted to capture that in terms of what we were doing with this project. What did it look like for um, the, the lecturers? Yes. So the context um, was the design studio. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the design studio, it's a physical space which is uh, set up in a rather informal in a way, usually in a large group settings or a large setting for, for groups and small groups and the, you know, the furniture is fairly flexible. Um, the idea of, of the design studio clearly is about face-to-face -face interaction and problem-based learning. Um, and the, uh, the intention certainly within our university is to, as best as we can, uh, mimic the, the kind of interactions that you might expect in the design industry. Um, students definitely learn passively in a, in a uh, studio environment, which is largely to do with the way in which they might um, learn as much from each other or listening, you know, eavesdropping on other people's conversations about their feedback from their tutors as it is um, in any other um, format. Now the, the, the thing that is particularly for studio and those are in the studio environment is trying to see for students the value of being there when they're not getting direct face-to-face in, uh, -face interaction with their tutors. Um, and that's just kind of like a, a zero-sum game really because we have uh, less time and more students to, to deal with. So we're looking at other ways in which we can provide uh, feedback. The, the point about this particular studio being a first year studio, which was also uh, an expectation that the students would receive uh, fairly continuous feedback um, but in the form of studio crits uh, at least once a fortnight. So it's a very kind of intensive process. So as I said, we, we've actually we've done two phases of our project, uh, which have now been completed and we're in the process of writing up. Um, the first phase was the initial pilot, which we were presenting at the ISOTL conference. Um, and in that, we really looked at the use of mobile and screen technologies here, uh, using the learning um, our learning management system Moodle. Uh, we also had the students in the initial pilot putting their um, assignments on Mahara and using that as our vehicle for giving them feedback. Um, we're not going to talk about that today. Um, there was a huge complexities around that, uh, mostly to do with Mahara, uh, which didn't work in quite the way that we had intended or hoped. But um, there were some interesting findings out of it, that's for sure. But the real focus, as Andrew said, was on around the feedback. Um, with some verbal feedback, uh, a lot of written feedback through um, Moodle uh, and the Mahara portfolio, um, using a rubric was a really key way of engaging with it because that we could make that very immediate for the students. Um, the second phase was a much broader one because the initial studio was very small uh, and that's why you know, it suited us to do it as a pilot. It was in uh, landscape architecture 
Our second phase was a much broader one where we really looked at um, how we could actually apply this to uh, the broader first year group, which included uh, industrial designers, architects, um, landscape architects, and interior. All, yeah, interior architects as well. So, um, and we started to actually think about uh, what does design mean and how do we actually get students to think about design? But that's part of the, the second phase, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the, um, in the presentation. So the, the problems that we, we were looking at for our, uh, in phase one, when we were very much starting out, is um, looking at the use of technology to provide the feedback so that we could actually see whether the students would, um, you know, to make sure that they were getting good feedback, um, stuff that they could go back to over time. Uh, one of the things that we noticed in, uh, and the staff noticed, the tutors noticed, is that students often aren't taking in, and I'm sure you have that same problem, uh, is that students often do not take in the feedback. And then when they uh, respond to it, they respond to what they think they've heard without necessarily responding to what they've actually heard. So we wanted to see uh, if using learning technologies would actually provide better feedback and how useful that was in terms of providing that feedback. So in terms of the uh, feedback, we know that uh, from students is that, you know, um, from, from Hattie's work in 2007, feedback is actually one of the, the key ways um, um, that students can learn and um, can gain a benefit from their learning. Uh, as long as they uh, use the feedback well. Now, in a studio, traditionally, the feedback is oral. And so what happens there is that there is a disconnect between what the students think they hear uh, and what they're actually hearing. So they have a lack of an understanding, they don't interpret it properly, uh, and then moving away from the studio, they then rely on their memory of what was said. Um, and of course, if there was any negative feedback, that's the immediate focus. They don't think about what that, you know, what it means. And once an assignment has been completed, they then focus on the grades without actually thinking about, well, what is that telling me about moving forward? So, that, and that was a big issue for us, is to then think of the value of feedback. And there's two parts to it, um, and you know, many of you would understand, is that if we're relying on tutors or people coming in on contract, even just the time to give feedback or to record feedback and then back to the students could be problematic in two ways. One, it's time consuming for the tutor, often you know, not being yeah. paid necessarily for that work. But the second one is, is that it could be in you know, days or even a week before they receive the feedback and by then they've pretty much forgotten what the, um, the, the purpose of the feedback was in the first place. So the idea is that we wanted to look at the idea of immediacy, so how immediately could their feedback be given to them and the notion of then how could the feedback be useful and what's known as the feed forward process. So what we actually did, we're using um, the notion that if, if we could actually give the students um, the uh, feedback in a, in a very predictable kind of way using smart technology like the smartphone, that they would actually be able to then take that information into their project and once they've received that good information, they would then be able to feed into the next week's project. Even to the extent now we've actually adopted practice in our studios where uh, in the final presentation for their major project work, jury kit is there specifically to give them information about their project and then they have another five to seven days to actually incorporate that into their project. And the evaluation for them is how well they do that, but also how well they answer questions on the project. That's okay. <laughs> That's, I'm preempting phase two. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a we had a, a few um, research questions um, that we were you know, looked at to see uh, to that guided our initial phase and we were looking at the type of feedback that students valued. Um, a really key one is whether they would actually use feedback to see whether they would improve the submissions, uh, how effective that was in terms of their final outcomes and also how useful obviously the technology was in providing that feedback and we that last question we really looked at, uh, we actually talked to the tutors and to find out what their experience was. 
So in terms of the, and I'm just going to quickly go through these next couple of slides, um, in terms of the, the types of value that students feedback, I mean, it's very predictable. Um, this has always been face-to-face. -face. Um, the students are very used to this type of feedback and, you know, they said that they preferred the verbal feedback. Um, and, you know, that was predictable. But having said that, they also um, liked the written feedback and, you know, there were those who actually thought that the, and as you can see there, that the rubric was in fact useful and very useful in terms of um, what they did with the feedback. Um, in, in looking at how much the students actually used it, um, we were actually quite pleased with the fact that the students, that most students um, had a go at, at actually looking at it and, um, and, and responding to it. Uh, particularly in the, that first instance where you can see, you know, 90% of students viewed it either more than once or viewed it once. We only had a very few students who, I, who did not view the work all the way through the semester, uh, with the worst percentage being um, at, after exercise four. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, we never um, really unpacked that. Um, but it was interesting to see that not everybody always looked at it in order to use it to improve their work. Um, obviously, um, this is another way of uh, looking at that. So as you can see, over the semester, um, the students' use of feedback you know, declined in terms of the viewing of that feedback. Um, it, this is a, a really uh, predictable timeline. We see this when we look at the use of uh, learning technologies in a whole range of different matters, uh, whether it's you know, viewing videos or um, you know, viewing tutorial materials in other subject areas. Um, this is this is very typical of um, of how students use the information we get on the learning management system. So um, I was actually quite pleased to see that that there were still actually quite so many students who actually did bother to come to come back and have a look at that. So um, in terms of the effectiveness, uh, predictably, um, you know, the students who actually did view the food feedback actually did improve their um, final results on, on the overall portfolio over that semester. And you can see that that's a, a significant though moderate positive correlation there. Um, and then here also the other thing that we looked at is how many times students viewed. And again, there was a moderate positive correlation uh, between the number of times that a students feed, viewed their feedback and their final results. So the more times they watched it, the better generally um, their assignments were. Right. In terms of the findings of our uh, of this first phase, um, I mean the numbers are very small so and we knew that and I mean that's why we chose this particular studio so uh, we can only say that you know in terms of a broader the broader scheme of things that the, num the findings were indicative but we were hoping that that would be replicated when we went into the, the larger studios. Um, obviously, we knew that students valued uh, verbal feedback. I mean, that's you know, very much, um, uh, you know, obviously that's it's expected in studio, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but we did also find that students who engage with the online feedback actually got better results. So this, this um, led us to, to uh, look at the other findings from that particular research and incorporate into our next stage. Um, one of them was the use of touch screens. Um, that was very interesting because the tutor's feedback in relation to using touch screens was that they actually had a device to be able to give students uh, a very consistent type of feedback in terms of the, the, the text in that um, feedback. Uh, it was useful for the students in that way. The other thing, obviously, from a technology perspective is that not only were they giving the feedback, but they were grading them using the rubric at the same time. And of course, as you know, the LMS generates the mark automatically, so there's not the need to go back and upload some sort of data sheet. Um, the other thing that was interesting, the kids reported that while they might have been giving the students feedback face to face using the rubric, like literally having their touch screen next to them, it was immediately after they finished feedback to that student moved on to the next one, that the, the student would then actually access their own iPhone or smart device and then look at what the feedback was that they got. So the immediacy there was really important because they could actually then spend some time and digest. Um, so it was very important that we talked about to the tutors about that and we actually asked them to give us some feedback on how that, um, that uh, device or that technology was useful 
and how we can use it to move forward. And uh, just go back. Yeah. yeah sorry. Um, what happened in that is that when the students got that immediate feedback, is that they then actually went back to the tutor to ask further questions. Oh, yes. And it was that engagement in the further conversations about how to move forward that were actually became really critical for us in thinking about, well, what does that mean for our next phase? Because we wanted to really capture that in some way. So um, what we decided was that uh, what we really needed to do is to um, be more intentional about the whole process. Um, we also, in reviewing you know, what we saw from students and what we heard from students, is that we needed to actually scaffold the task a little bit more explicitly. But also um, give students, because we really wanted to stop that dip um, after you know, about week three or four, um, is to give students some advice and some training on how they actually needed to use feedback. Um, and also, obviously, for tutors to actually start being more explicit about that feed-forward process, and how could we embed that into uh, project learning in in the studio? So we mentioned this before. We we, we went from a a, uh, a single discipline landscape architecture studio, which was a first year studio, um, in 2014, 2015. And then 2014, and then ramped up to a cross disciplinary studio where we were 120 plus students. Um, it was a foundation studio, so the introduction to design. It was the first studio for these students, and we always talk about how they're learning a new language, but we don't teach it like a language, so they, a lot of it they have to kind of pick up, and the, a lot of the new terminologies and approaches are very much a very steep learning curve. Um, and in terms of being intentional, what we actually then did was both in discussions with the tutors and the and the uh, our team was to use a generic design thinking theoretical framework around um, convergence and divergence process cognitive processes. Um, and the other thing too is, is that in the change assessment, as I said previously, is we incorporated a feed forward method. Um, uh, another small aspect was that the studio convener of, of that studio actually recorded a uh, a video at the beginning of the semester um, that students could watch at the end of the semester about the studio and, and so on. And then a, a number of other short videos all the way through that were around the intentional use of language for the students so that you know, every time there was a new uh, topic that she would get one of the other tutors or one of the other lecturers or one of the other design discipline experts to come in and talk about the language of that topic. So it wasn't a, wasn't a lecture per se. It no. was a bit like what we're doing here. Yeah. It was actually like what we're doing here. It was actually yeah. talking to the screen to the student. Yeah. It felt a bit more one on one, um, and that was important. The last thing we did do was we actually tailored the rubrics, so the actual terminology and the rubrics to each assessment. Now the setup, and I, this is the point I think which is really important. The setup to doing all of that seemed to be quite intense at the beginning, but the time that saved during the semester in terms of marking and feedback and managing students was well worth it. I mean, you know, the, the time savings was incredible. So this is this is the theoretical framing. We used the, the kind of the fairly standard convergent divergent divergent thinking process and we framed that over a week. Um, the idea of course being that the feedback would be given at a point of convergence. That's the point at which the students would understand that the information they were giving to to them at the time was to rationalise their thinking into something that was coherent. But importantly, this is the periods when they are not in studio or they were not having a formal face-to-face -face contact, that they were able to, to explore, be more explorative or, or create in a sense um, in, in that uh, divergent thinking phase. Um, we felt that if you were to give, you weren't explaining to the students this idea of divergence and convergence, they would I think that the design process is continual with testing environment. And that's that's still something that we need to work through, but it's a it's a good framework. So the studio the, the semester looks like a caterpillar, perhaps. Um, and the you can see on the screen here we have AO1, AO2, AO3 are the, the different um, assessments. And you can see the formative and summative feedback points. So each of those times that the students saw that and they saw that the purpose of being in the studio was to be able to uh, take the creative thinking, the creative work 
uh, that they've done during the week, even if that meant sitting under a tree and thinking about stuff and sketching, but they're able to then get feedback about how they progress to the next stage. Um, it also encourages iteration, so it meant that not necessarily each of those points, so those black dots along the screen, are points of progression. It might be that they revisit a, a stage and design process, um, but in, from a, a teaching and learning perspective and over a 12 week semester, those points are very important as points of convergence. So in terms of the, the findings, um, predictably as students move through the semester, um, they look less and less and less at the videos um, and relied more and more and more on, on their, their, themselves. Um, the introduction to Design Studio where the uh, lecturer actually talked about this process and this iterative process uh, was probably the most viewed uh, of all the videos. Um, but again, it's, it's something that's very predictable um, in that we know that students um, don't watch necessarily everything uh, that we put up. And so, um, as, I, as I told the lecturer when she looked at these low numbers, I said, actually, these are quite good numbers in the overall scheme of things when compared with um, what we know from other subjects. So, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as bad as that looks. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's true. Yeah. Um, and the, the other one we want to show you is this. Yeah. This is, a, this is a really interesting one. What we really wanted to look at is how much students actually access the feedback. And because we wanted to really introduce this notion of feed forward, we wanted to see how much they would access feedback over the time of the semester. And so um, the red is uh, that first assignment, the blue the second assignment, and the green is the final assignment. And you can see that over the time, students are constantly going back and forth and back and forth. Even uh, where they're viewing um, the third assignment right at the beginning of the first assignment because they are starting to engage with that notion that this is progressive and that one thing actually feeds to the, to the next thing and into the next thing. So we really like this because it did mean that students were starting to um, understand and, and connect with this notion of, of iteration and exploration uh, over time and feed forward over that time. And I think the other thing that's important with this one was is that this is also a good uh, response to changing the level of intentionality in the way that the projects mm -hmm. were described. So when we talk about scaffolding projects so each one builds on the other, we might understand that, but the first year students think scaffolding is to get the side of a building. So they're, they're actually more about, it's more about the idea that they could get a sense of how each of the projects contributed to the whole of the studio and the learning outcomes of the studio themselves. And I think that this is quite encouraging to see that particularly the first and the last um, assignments had quite a lot of actual feed, uh, views both before and after the assessment period. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the students learning, um, when because it's a, we used the rubric, we didn't actually give the students the marks for the formative, but we did collect that information in our Moodle. Um, and uh, we were finding that the average was around about uh, 57, uh, 60. I know an average is a very broad, but it just uh, it shows uh, you know kind of where the students were in terms of that formative assignment. Um, and then in the summative, we noticed a, a huge improvement. You know, really showing that students actually engaged, and certainly that that previous slide showed the same information. Students were very much engaged with it, very uh, intentional in it, and and viewed uh, quite repetitively um, the the feedback that we were giving them online. So they weren't just relying uh, on the the verbal feedback that they were getting from the tutors. Um, and and it, similarly, the tutors also reported that the students were really prepared to make quite significant conceptual changes in their final submission. And I think that's reflected in, in that huge jump from you know the formative to the summative uh, results in terms of the students' learning. So I should add, I'll just, just explain that the, the percentage numbers there is the average grade yeah. for the Sorry. students, yeah. the difference between the formative. So that one week may have been difference in terms of their improvements. Um, and, and it's probably, for me, most of all, it showed the value of giving the students the additional week with that formal feedback in order to improve. And I've adopted that in my more senior studios and I find the students, 
faculty. We like having to spend another week on their project, but the improvements are significant. There's no doubt about that. Mm. Um, and it's particularly valuable when you have guest tutors who come in and they're specifically asked to give uh, give feedback, knowing that that feedback will be incorporated into the next stage of the project. Yeah. Um, obviously, the final submission is then submitted on online on the Moodle and it's moderated, but there's certainly an improvement. It's great. Mm. Limitations. Well, again, I mean, our numbers are small um, in terms of the, I think this is actually the old, um, some of this is the old, in, in terms of our overall numbers, uh, in, the first two, in the first pilot study, the, the numbers were very small, um, and in the second, um, well, they were better, but yeah, I mean, it's yeah. 120, so, you know, we're not talking about a huge university here. Um, there was some difficult, this is why we really focused on that second assignment more than the first and the third, because we had some difficulty with the software, uh, primarily in terms of uh, the ability for, you know, in the particular studio area, um, for the two just to actually give the immediate feedback because um, the Wi-Fi wasn't operating, so go figure, which yeah. is always, you know. Yeah. Um, pull your hair out. Yeah, pull your hair out stuff. Uh, there's, there's a level of uncertainty about, I mean, we, we can sort of say, um, Yes, we believe that this process is what caused the actual improvement, um, but in terms of causality, um, you know, it's difficult to really uh, make that statement really clearly, except for that, you know, in terms of the ongoing process and we're continuing to use the process in our studios. Um, we're certainly finding that that improvement is actually um, replicated over time. And, and I think the other thing too is that um, there's obviously probably more focus group type work that could be done mm, with the yeah, students in more. terms of finding out whether the improvements were just simply having more time or whether the value of the feedback was as we thought it might be. Um, so yes, thank yeah. you very much. You want to talk to the last point? I didn't know. Sorry. No. Yeah, okay. Sorry. No. Sorry. It's not reorganised. Um, um, so the evidence of convergence is clear. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting one because clearly, and I guess you'd all understand this, is that if you're in a situation where you're talking to students, they're trying to focus on the words you say in relation to how do they improve their grade, and that is definitely a point of convergence. They're trying to solve a, a problem, and that is how do I, how do I digest and take in and incorporate um, uh, feedback to, to some extent. Not everybody's the same. Um, but the other thing too is it's actually a bit difficult to determine um, the evidence of divergence, and I guess in some way that's a, almost an, an epistemological question. It's a bit of a mm -hmm. problem because we can't necessarily then say um, that we know divergence is happening, other than we're seeing progression through the project itself. So there is something happening. We just don't know how it's happening. Again, something that could be done more qualitatively. Um, and so, uh, and then last point, of course, is that understanding how students progress through that design process where the iteration is actually really happening the way we think it might be happening. Um, certainly in terms of the, the outcomes, the endpoints, we're, we're quite happy with the results, mm -hmm. but there's a lot in the process that I think we can unpack. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew.
It'll make a good point. Hey guys. Any any questions from anybody? Yeah. We can't hear them, but they can hear us. Okay, yeah, yeah. So Oh, sorry, no, no. Answers. Yes, we do. One second. Yes, no. Go love technology. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. No, we can't hear anybody here. No. Anybody there? I oh, know, we've got a speaker back on. No, ours, yeah, ours is on, but they're not speaking. Can you explain a little bit more about the application of the free toward concept? Do you want to start with the series? Um, okay, so um, feed forward is a is a concept that's been um, happening uh, that's been getting into the literature um, about uh, and the the person who started this is Carlos and you can actually see um, his, the references there on the screen. There's the two references and the idea is that rather than just giving feedback to the students on an assignment, um, they uh, that you give them feed forward. You actually make it explicit that the information that you're giving them is um, not just a, a summative assessment, but it's about giving them uh, further information so that they can move forward and uh, write better or produce better assignments over time. So Carla's actually called these um, learning-oriented assignments um, so that they are focused around learning rather than just uh, a summative summative and it's about making that explicit to the students um, so uh, they don't just look at the grade and say oh well I've got a 90 or I've got a 60 or I, you know I failed um, but that they actually start to look at um, this is um, this is information I need to to move on um, and to um, to do better and so that's why we actually if you want to go to that the, the our caterpillar oh, yeah. um, it, it's about giving them enough information, and that's why we actually gave them the week in there, um, as you can see here on the on the screen. If I can just reach across Andrew to get this, because I'm hoping you can see my mouse. Uh, here it is. So the idea was that they would get the assignment instructions here, and then go away, and at these points of diver divergence, is to be thinking about it, working on it, and then to come back, and we would actually give them um, here some information. Uh, that they would then use that information as a formative way of moving on and thinking further, and then they would get uh, assignment work, you know, uh, summative work here, a summative uh, assessment here, but still with information that would then allow them to go into divergence again and move into the next assignment. So that each of these build into the other, and the learning is to be built into the other. So it's really about making that really intentional and explicit to the students. The other one that um, I think is worthwhile thinking about feed forward is that if you're thinking about whether you're giving students advice on how to progress their individual project or whether you're thinking about giving them advice on whether they're achieving the learning outcomes that they've been set out in the project, feed forward really uh, encourages students to think about how they take responsibility for their own learning. So they're not just saying, so what do I do next? Um, which is often the case. In fact, one of the actual criteria you can't see in the slide there is called engagement in the work. And, and so we can actually even give them feed forward on how they are actually receiving their feedback. Um, you know, it's any point where if you're saying to a student, look, you know, you're doing a good job or you're doing a satisfactory job or your work is not satisfactory and you can explain why, then it's really up to them. Um, no, we we didn't, uh, Ruth. To answer your question around um, does it does it uh, remove important doing time from the studio? Um, the intention of this is actually to take away the pressure on the studio, um, so that uh, the students aren't relying on a constant iterative 
feedback, uh, verbal feedback from the, from the tutor all the way through because they'll already have important information here that, it's, that is both written and, and visible that they can actually refer to over time. And you'll, you'll remember from our, uh, that, that slide that I showed you with the feedback access um, that um, this is in fact the students got this, they understood this, that um, they could actually go back over time, like because because the they were all cumulative and the the learning in these three assignments was cumulative, even though the task itself was different for each one. Um, students understood or started to understand that they could actually go back and forth constantly to get that information, so that they weren't actually relying on tutor feedback all the time. So they weren't wasting time. What we'd had previously is that the students would just sit in the studio and wait for the tutor to come around. Um, and so by having this, it meant that they could actually move and work and do things without having to wait. Um, so in fact, it, it actually made for more productive time rather than less productive time we found over time. So yes, Ruth. Um, so Chris, um, another way to think about it in terms of immediacy is the points of convergence of students, and i.e. that interaction with their tutors in a studio that could be three or four hours, is only about five minutes or ten minutes, depending on how much time you've got to speak to them. So the points of convergence are really quite quite quick. Um, the, the, the idea of the immediacy is, is that you're giving them really uh, consistent information that's predictable. I know the, the nature of the type of information they're going to get. Um, it's qualitative. But they also then have that opportunity to then say, OK, well, I've got this information. What do I do now? How do I move yeah. on to next? So that's actually been quite use, useful. Um, your, the question around moderation, um, I, I think that's a, a really... Uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, because we use, um, it, certainly in, in the, the first year um, studio, a lot of the feedback is given by two or three tutors um, at, at times. So um, they actually share feedback and they move uh, across um, the oh, tutorial yeah. so that you're not getting feedback from just one tutor. Yeah. So because the, the, our studio space is, uh, is uh, I don't know what yours looks like, but this one here is... is um, spread across an entire floor where all the tutors are with each other and working with each other and all the tutorials are next to each other. So um, that feedback, and we're kind of hoping that that kind of works as a, as a point of moderation. Uh, but well, certainly in terms of the last one, um, the, the final assessment is, is moderated. So um, Yeah, well each, each of the assessments, there's three assessment points where they're actually they're getting a, a grade and each of those are moderated. Oh. So that's yeah. That's essentially where it is, but we don't moderate weekly. We don't moderate weekly or formative no. no. things. No. Kill us. Um, the software's um, Moodle, it's LMS. Yeah, um, it Moodle, is. Moodle, if you go into Gradebook and you go to what advanced, grading. advanced Grading, you can actually set up a, a, um, a, set rubric. Up a rubric, which you probably know about, but it's actually simply then that if you then use a touch screen, the touch screen obviously gives the grade instead of clicking on a mouse on a screen, you, you do it yeah. with a smartphone. Yeah. So, babies and babies, you know. yeah, so you can do that on a tablet, you can do that on a computer, you can do that on your phone. Um, you can literally just sit there and touch the, the yeah. relevant square that so, you've got the students doing so it. Sheridan, the student feedback was that they really liked yeah. the fact that they could get that written feedback immediately. on a device immediately. Yeah. Um, there's two parts to that. I think one of them is affirmation, that they I mean, students generally know how they're travelling. Um, the second one is, is that underneath the, the, so we use the two terms, the qualitative terms, so we, in our moderation policy, you know, satisfactory means pass, good means credit, you know, excellence or superior means distinction and outstanding side distinction. So you can use those terms and then explain why underneath that and they value that. I think the other thing that's important is that they still given the option, we'd love to sit down and chat for half an hour. You know, I'd love to just talk and talk and talk, and we just can't do that. So it's trying to make a connection between the verbal feedback, which they like, obviously for obvious reasons, and the written feedback, which they can see. So that was useful. Um, there was a question we missed, uh, who designed the touchscreen rubric? Um, we set us a team um, and, and wrote that, and then I, as the... Um, curriculum designer came in and, and helped them to tidy Word, it up yeah. and, and work around words and help them to understand how to build up the levels. So um, 
Yeah, so that was, it was a, a team effort. All of us came in and we did it together, sat there together. And in fact, it was also important part of the uh, orientation and, well, for the tutors in effect. Mm. So yeah. actually going through with the tutors and designing that. And they're more than happy to contribute to simply because they knew that there was a significant time saving um, advantage of being part of that front end and they feel like their opinion was valued as well. Um, E-portfolios, um, don't use Mahara. Um, oh, sorry. Um. <laughs> no, okay, so I, I can answer that. I, yeah, think, I, think, I think the idea of an e-portfolio is fine if you give no restrictions on the student in to, as to the, the nature of the mm. way they produce yeah, the e-portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody wants to draw in a, an art book, and hand sketch and then scan that and stick it in a repository of some sort, yep. then go for it. We just, if, if we get all tied up about the idea of portfolios having to be a particular software, then that's yeah. kind of, that's kind of against the principles of creative practice anyway. If we get, oh Chris, if we actually get the students to, other tutors to contribute or participate in the designing of the rubric, um, which can be done online, it doesn't have to come in for a meeting, and then actually um, do a run through, a pretend. So we set one of them up as a student and we just say, well, this is how you do it. Um, it doesn't take very long at all. Um, because it's the second, third year we've done it, the chairs that we're using for the studio have been the same essentially for the whole way through. Yeah. So you test them once, it's not that hard. It's very intuitive. I mean, that's the thing. I guess the main thing is really more about. Uh, talking to the tutors about intentionality rather than the technology itself. Yeah. And that is make sure that you're thinking about how you're giving feedback and how that reflects what's on the, um, the, the rubric. It also avoids a lot of the I think or I like or I don't like type responses that you might get from somebody who's not traditionally used to being in a studio environment and students hate. They hate the I like or I don't like responses. Um, there was a question around how the summative marks um, compared to previous years. Um, we did look at that and our findings was that they had improved, but um, because, you know, marks can improve from year yeah. to year. Um, too many variables. Yeah, too many variables. We didn't really want to um, make that part of the findings over, overall in, in this time. I think we would need to have uh, you know, repeat this finding um, over a number of years in order to be able to positively say that yes, it was as a result of this process. Certainly in terms of what we saw um, anecdotally, yes, there was definitely a, a, an improvement. Um, and also the comments from our um, external uh, marker, so for the final studio crit we get in people from our community yeah. who come in and help with it. And their comments were really positive and they made observations about how good the outcomes were this year and how much better than they were in previous years. So certainly we've got that sort of anecdotal feedback that yes, things went were really well. Um, also for the second years, um, we found that the tutors there were saying that students seemed to be better prepared uh, than they had previously. But again, that's anecdotal. Um, it would have to be repeated over a number of years to really you know, be able to say, yeah, that was definitely as a result of what we've done rather than as a result of, you know, it was a good year group. So, um, all the content, all the lectures were delivered online, yes. Um, all they were, we had, um, they had face-to-face -face lectures, but they're all recorded, so students have access to that information. Um, but again, we didn't see a lot of students engaging with the online lectures so much. Uh, I think the key ones were the videos that we put on, the extra videos. So these were in additional to, I don't think I made that clear, these were actually in additional to the lectures. And they were literally around the language. Because one of the things that we wanted to do was be really intentional about language and, and the use of language and getting students to really understand and engage with design language. Um, and design thinking, so being really explicit and intentional about that. So those videos were around that. So it was really good to see that the students were actually um, uh, accessing that additional information over and above all the other information that we actually gave them. Um, now just just um, so you know, and I should tell Karen this, I have a student doing his confirmation PhD oh. seminar <laughs> in, in 10 minutes. I really have to go. Shortly, yeah. So I'm going to oh. say, Goodbye and okay. meeting with Karen. I thought she'd yep. be very more than capable. If there's any specific questions, 
Or if anybody's actually really interested in replicating this study in their own studio, please get in contact with us. Um, we're in the process of publishing yeah. um, this, but we'd really love to see it scale up and see how it works in other areas. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Because we were not equipped. Hang on a second, guys. Hang on a second. <laughs> I'm glad you're still here. Sorry about that. Um, just the computer just logged off. Logged off. Yeah. Uh, one more question from Chris. Uh, that's okay, Chris. Uh, how did the international and just very quickly international second language students engage with the model? Because we actually have quite a, a few. Um, I don't know. Joe. We didn't actually look at that. Yeah, yeah, we actually, I have to say, we didn't look at that, Chris, uh, and we didn't um, uh, explicitly uh, follow it up. And but it, it also, it wasn't a problem. Right. So um, you know, I, I think if it had been a problem, we would have probably engaged with it at yeah. a different level. But because yeah. it didn't actually and arise. Try they comprehend written Yeah. Well, that's so. true. Yeah. We do find that students, actually, international students, tend to engage better with the written text than they do with the spoken text. So. Um, on a theoretical basis, they probably would do better with the written. So, um, but yeah, we didn't look at that. Okay. The slide show are these video views or views of feedback relevant to future assessment? Yes, uh, Chris. Yes, they were. Um, so the videos um, that we uh, developed. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my at my cheat sheet here. Um, these ones here actually linked to so students on design, light and tone, color, ordering elements. These all linked to the particular assignments in question. Um, and um, uh, and the feed forward was also relevant. So it was about building up the, the, because this is a first semester, first uh, year studio. studio um, this is around uh, building up knowledge of and uh, of the language and um, ability to do design. So each of these build on the others. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So that you know the the videos were around the assignments and then the feed forward was around the assignments and we expected to see an improvement of these areas over the course of the semester with students building on the other building on their knowledge and skills over time over the three assignments. Um, Unfortunately, uh, no, we can't give you access. Um, I could probably do some uh, screenshots, but um, we can't because it's a, an LMS. And um, so, yeah, so unfortunately, Hong Mei, we, we can't do that. But um, look, you know, give it, email us and we can certainly pick up a conversation around it if, if you're interested. Okay. Thanks, everyone.